when God brings about change and people are responding to that change and maybe that leads to even change in leadership, not everybody finds it easy to get on board with that. And we see a little bit of that happening in the missionary group that we've been seeing. So let's get into today's events. So Paul, Barnabas and John Mark are really adventuring into something completely new because hands have been laid upon them and they have set out to take the gospel of Jesus. And what is beginning to become apparent is there's something on Paul that means he's going to take this message to the Gentiles. Now, in the just a couple of sentences back, it said that Saul, who was also called Paul. And from now on in the book of Acts, uh, Luke refers to Saul by this name Paul. Saul is the Hebrew name. Paul is the Roman name. And perhaps it's because uh, Luke is helping us to become aware of this new mission that Paul has to uh, really reach out and make connection with the Gentiles, those who have not been brought up as Jews. And from Paphos, Paul and his companions, writes Luke, set sailed from Perga in Pamphylia, where John, John Mark, left them to return to Jerusalem. Why did John Mark leave them? Perhaps the clue is there in this actual sentence, because instead of Barnabas and Paul, Luke has written Paul and his companions. Barnabas is very much still with Paul. But now Paul has become the primary leader of this group. Well, that's definitely of God. We know that from history. But maybe John Mark was struggling a bit with, after all, he was related to Barnabas. And maybe he didn't like Paul taking over that leadership. This often happens when things change in churches. Even when it's of God, some people can struggle with it. But things will be sorted, although Paul wasn't that happy at this point about it, as we will see later in Acts. But anyway, from Perga, Barnabas and Saul, or Paul and Barnabas now, they went down down to Poseidon, Poseidon Antioch. Uh, now, this is not the same Antioch as the Antioch that they've just left. This is another one. In fact, there's about 16 or 17 Antiochs in existence at this time uh, in history uh, in the ancient world. They were all fun, uh, founded or at least taken over by uh, a, a guy called Seleucius, uh, who was one of Alexander the Great's generals. And he had this habit of naming cities after his father, who was Antiochus. So there you go. Just like lots of Herods, there's lots of Antiochs. Anyway, in this particular Antioch, on the Sabbath, they entered the synagogue and sat down. That's the normal thing to do in the synagogue. And after reading from the law and the prophets, the leaders of the synagogue sent a word to them saying, Brothers, if you have a word of exhortation for the people, please speak. Well, Paul's going to make the most of every opportunity. Standing up, Paul motioned with his hand and said, Fellow Israelites and you Gentiles who worship God, listen to me. The God of the people of Israel chose our ancestors. He made the people prosper during their stay in Egypt. With mighty power, he led them out of that country. For about 40 years, he endured their conduct in the wilderness. And he overthrew seven nations in Canaan, giving their land to his people as an inheritance. All this took about 450 years. After this, God gave them judges until the time of Samuel the prophet. Then the people asked for a king, and he gave them Saul, son of Kish, of the tribe of Benjamin, who ruled 40 years. After removing Saul, he made David their king. God testified concerning him, I have found David, a son of Jesse, a man after my own heart. He will do everything I want him to do. From this man's descendants, God has brought to Israel the Saviour, Jesus, as he promised. Can you see what Paul is doing here? He's talking to Jews or some Gentiles who've become uh, God-fearers and are worshipping at the synagogue with them. So Paul, he's using their history, he's using their culture in, normal to, in order to enable him to connect with these people. As John was completing his work, sorry, before the coming of Jesus, 
John preached repentance and baptism to all the people of Israel. As John was completing his work, he said, Who do you suppose I am? I am not the one you're looking for, but there is one coming after me whose sandals I am not worthy to untie. So he's linking in the history, he's linking in the culture, he's linking in their religious understanding into that Jesus the Messiah is part of that and he walked into that. It's part of what we have to do as church as well today. It, it, Paul realises that it's not just enough for people to believe in Jesus. You can't just tell them, rather, to believe in Jesus. They need to know why they need to listen. Uh, you, you have to create something which enables them to listen, or otherwise it can be just dismissed as irrelevant. It was irrelevant to them in one sense because Jesus was not what they expected of the Messiah. So he makes this appeal to history and their understanding. They need to know, everyone needs to know why they should believe in Jesus and what Jesus has done before they can put their faith in him. And you do that by using the cult around. We also do it by uh, being part of a community. Now, because we love where we live, we love the people and we want to be as Jesus in this community, Jesus incarnate, we sometimes call it. Jesus walking in this community as much as we can as the church. And because God has called us to love our neighbour, of course we should be making the towns or the cities wherever we live a better place to be in. But part of that also is hopefully enabling people to hear, why are you doing that? And that is part of enabling people to listen to this gospel. Fellow children of Abraham and you God-fearing Gentiles, says Paul, it is to us that this message of salvation has been sent. The people of Jerusalem and their rulers did not recognise Jesus, yet in condemning him they fulfilled the words of the prophets that are read every Sabbath. Though they found no proper grounds for a death sentence, they asked Pilate to have him executed. When they had carried out all that had been written about him, they took him down from the cross and laid him in a tomb. But God raised him from the dead, and for many days he was seen by those who had travelled with him from Galilee to Jerusalem. They are now the witnesses to our people. We're telling you good news. What God has promised our ancestors, he has fulfilled for us, their children, by raising up Jesus. As it is written in the second psalm, You are my son. Today I have become your father. God raised him from the dead so that he would never be subject to decay. As God has said, I will give you the holy and sure blessings promised to David. So it is stated elsewhere, you will not let your holy one see decay. Now when David had served God's purposes in his generation, he fell asleep. He was buried with his ancestors. His body clearly decayed. But... The one whom God raised from the dead did not see decay. Therefore, my friends, I want you to know that through Jesus, the forgiveness of sins is proclaimed to you. Through him, everyone who believes is set free from sin, a justification you couldn't obtain under the law of Moses. Take care what the prophets have said, that it doesn't happen to you. And he quotes again, Look, you scoffers, wonder and perish, for I'm about to do something in your days that, if you would if, that you would never believe, even if someone who told you. Notice that here that Paul is speaking to mainly Jews and Gentiles, and that uh, Gentiles who are God-fearers. And that's important that we get that, because, of course, Paul and Barnabas have been set apart, and Paul's set apart particularly is to reach the Gentiles. And here they're speaking to the Jews. Not that that's wrong in any way whatsoever, but it's not the fulfilment of what Paul has got to do. As Paul and Barnabas were leaving the synagogue, the people invited them to speak further about these things the next Sabbath. And when the congregation was dismissed, many of the Jews and devout converts to Judaism followed Paul and Barnabas who taught with them and urged them to continue in the grace of God. On the next Sabbath, almost the whole city gathered to hear the word of God. When the crowds, or sorry, when the Jews saw the crowds, they were filled with jealousy. They began to contradict what Paul was saying and heaped abuse upon him. Sadly, it's a very old thing that when we come to argue, 
often the way we try and win our argument is by just discrediting and pouring abuse on those who have a different point of view. Then Paul and Barnabas answered them loudly, We had to speak the word of God to you first. Since you reject it and do not consider yourselves worthy of eternal life, we now turn to the Gentiles, for this is what the Lord has commanded us to do. The Jewish people are God's chosen people. The gospel is always first for the Jewish people. It always will be first for the Jewish people because of the way he's called them and what they have suffered in his name. But then it's for the Gentiles, not in a secondary lesser way, but it is a, a releasing for us. But it doesn't mean it's passed by the Jewish people at all. I have made you a light for the Gentiles that you may bring salvation to the ends of the earth, quotes Paul. When the Gentiles heard this, they were glad and honoured the word of the Lord, and all who were appointed for eternal life believed. The word of the Lord spread throughout the whole region, but the Jewish leaders incited God-fearing women of high standing and the leading men of the city. They stirred up persecution against Paul and Barnabas and expelled them from their region. So they shook their dust off their feet as a warning to them and went to Iconium. And the disciples were filled with joy and with the Holy Spirit. Shaking off the dust of their feet was showing that the responsibility is now yours. You have the word of God. It is your responsibility. There does come a time often when we can feel, we, and sometimes it's necessary as well, if we carry the burden at all times of, oh, those people haven't responded we could actually put ourselves under a weight that's not supposed to be there. There is a time to leave the things behind, but there's also to make sure that we never give up in God's strength. So they leave behind everything that's happened and they leave God to work. But Luke really emphasises here, this doesn't get to them or to the disciples, the new ones. They are filled with joy and they are filled with the Holy Spirit. And this is a good response to failure, that we want to be filled with joy and we want to be filled with the Holy Spirit, even when things don't work out. It's not always easy to follow Jesus. I, and Paul and Barnabas have just had hands laid on them and they've just been sent out in the power of the Holy Spirit. They're probably their first expectations was better than what they've got. One of their team has already lost, left them behind, John Mark. So there's now just the two of them. And... They get into the city, they get initially this, this, there's a really good response, they get invited back, but then persecution comes to such a point they actually have to leave the city. And even when we're doing exactly the right thing, or perhaps sometimes even because we're doing the right thing, it's not always easy to follow Jesus. It's not always success, success, success. Even with the laying on of hands, it, there can be other things happening. And when we fail, we can ask important questions. For example, is the failure due to our lack of commitment to his word and his purposes? Are we just being too lazy? That question should be asked. Is our failure because we're not truly submitted to God's authority? Perhaps we've just got some better ideas about how things should be done and we're not really following with what God has given us to do. Another really important third question is, do we really want God's will above our own will? Those are three good questions to ask. But I think when we ask those of Paul and Barnabas in this situation, they would be saying yes. Um, or, 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 or a positive response to it. Their failure wasn't due to a commitment to the Lord. They certainly weren't lazy. No one's ever going to cause Paul the apostle of being lazy. They were submitted to his life. They weren't just trying to do their own thing. And they were wanting the full will of God. Sometimes what we go through is just the journey. And here for Paul, particularly I think Paul, is being underscored that his call is going to be to the Gentiles. If he'd been massively successful in these synagogues, he may have never become the fullness of what he'd been set apart for. Really, we're finally left, even in failure, with Paul's words himself when he wrote, Give thanks in all circumstances, for this is God's will for you in Christ Jesus. Even when it's not working, what we've got to do is just be thankful. And in that thankfulness, we will remain joyful rather than getting down about it. And we will continually be filled 
with the Holy Spirit. God bless you, everybody. Keep safe and choose your path wisely. If you're liking these videos and would like us to continue making them, please don't forget to click the subscribe button and tick the bell to get notifications. Thank you so much. Thank you.